So as we move on to central Italy, we leave the north behind. We leave the colder weather, the excess of rain, the pasture land, so on and so forth. And we move south to what is the seat of the Renaissance. Florence is right there. That's really the seat of cuisine. That's where all the classical cooking in Italy really got its start. Um, but in as much as we're studying Mediterranean cuisine, the really important thing is that the weather now is mild enough that the olive tree can do well. It's not so mild that you don't have to pay attention. So in Tuscany, for instance, when they harvest olives, they do it before the first hard frost or even snow because they know that the olives will be lost if they are frozen. For that reason, they harvest early and because if they harvest early, they get a greener oil, you start to see a cuisine that, that lines up behind that, behind that oil. So bitter greens and big flavors. Um, from one end of Italy to another, you'll see pasta. And I thought it might be fun to begin today by making a pasta. So let's get started. Come on over here and I've got a food processor set up. And in that, I have some flour. Uh, I think of this as pasta flour. It is a blend of all-purpose flour with a little bit of durum flour mixed in. Durham flour is a hard wheat flour. It has a lot of gluten, a lot of protein, and it's that protein that when you mix it with water becomes very, very elastic. That's the nature of wheat flour. Uh, you can think of it almost like muscles. You know, you mix it and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And that strength is what allows our pasta to withstand the rigors of uh, being rolled and rolled and cut and then ultimately cooked. So I've got about a pound of flour here in the food processor. And I'm going to turn it on and begin to add eggs. It'll make a little bit of noise, so I'll stop along the way. But I think this will take about four eggs. And I'm looking for something really particular. I don't want this to form a ball of dough the way you might if you were making bread in the food processor, but rather I'm looking for it to resemble moist sand that begins to cascade on itself. So channel your inner child and imagine you've built a sand castle that is now collapsing. That's what we're looking for. So let's take a look. This hasn't really formed a ball of dough, but it is kind of cascading in on itself. And if I take it out and hold it in my hand, you can see what it looks like. It looks a little bit like wet sand, but watch what happens when I give it a squeeze. It's moist enough to bind together. That's what I'm after. So I'm gonna take this mixture and we'll bring it over here. And I wanna put it out on the table so we can get a better look at it. Now, because it hasn't formed a ball, it really hasn't begun to knead. And it's the kneading, the exercising of this dough that will make it stronger. But doing it this way, you'll be able to see exactly what's happening. First thing I want to do is gather this up into a single piece of dough. And with a little convincing, it will stick together into kind of a shaggy mass. It's not particularly sticky, so it's fairly dry. I'm gonna have a little bit of flour here in case we need it. And what I'd like to do is knead this by rolling it through the rollers of the pasta machine and then folding it on itself and putting it back through the rollers. Uh, this, in effect, will mimic kneading. The first time through, what you're gonna notice is it's gonna be very ragged it will likely tear in a couple of places. I'll piece it back together, and with each subsequent trip through the pasta machine, it will become more and more cohesive, smoother, and um, it's really a pretty fun process to watch. This pasta machine here is kind of a Rolls Royce. I'm sure you don't have something like this at home. Uh, even at my home, I've got the old hand crank pasta machine. So don't despair if that's what you've got because it works just as well. All right, here we go.
All right, take a look. Very ragged. It's checked along the edge. It's even torn right down here. We're going to fold it into thirds. Press it together. And again, let's send it through. The second time through, already you can see it becoming more cohesive. The, eggs, the edges are no longer checked. It hasn't torn anywhere. And we'll put it through again. Okay, I'm going to carry on putting this through the machine until it becomes very, very smooth and developed. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to describe the smoothness that I'm looking for. Uh, a lot depends on what your point of reference is. If you've ever bought a brand new baseball glove, it'll feel like that brand new leather or a new handbag. Uh, some people liken it to the way a baby's bottom feels. Uh, but I'll show you what it looks like when it's all ready to go. If you take a look at this dough, it's smooth along the edges and the surface of it is very smooth. I'm going to go with baby bottom today, I think. It's very firm and very, very smooth. At this point, you might want to wrap the dough up and let it just relax for a little while. It's recently exercised, recently developed so that uh, allowing the, the gluten, the protein, to relax means that you can roll it through without it tearing. Um, I feel pretty confident that we can roll this right down. So I'm going to roll it all the way down to, um, on this machine, about one, one and a half. That's the thickness that I want the pasta ultimately to be. At some point, I may have to divide this in two because the piece of pasta will get progressively longer and longer. And likely this piece of dough would be as long as this counter unless I cut it in half. One quick thing, there is an efficiency to be realized by working with a piece of dough that's the full width of your roller. So don't send a little tiny thin strip of pasta through the machine. Try to get the, the dough the same width as the rollers. So, I was showing off a little bit, and probably I should have cut that into smaller pieces, but if you get to the point where it needs to be cut into smaller pieces, it's an easy thing to do. Just put a little flour on there, and we'll set that up here. Here's another piece. One thing that may surprise you if you've made your own pasta before is that up to this point, my pasta dough really hasn't stuck together. And that is indicative of a pasta dough that is mixed a little bit drier. Um, that I think is an important idea, that you mix it a little bit drier. If you put too much water in there, what ends up happening is you get a dough that, uh, while it cooks quickly, it doesn't have the bite that you expect from good pasta. All right, so the pasta is all rolled out. Uh, obviously, I can't have a piece of pasta this long. You would twirl your fork forever trying to wind it up. So think about cutting it into pieces about uh, 10, 10 to 12 inches long, something like that. And it's a good idea at this point just to make sure that before you stack it up, you put a little flour on it because you don't want this to stick together. You've worked too hard up to this point. We're going to cut this pasta by hand. Many pasta machines come with, with rollers that will cut it into ribbons, the width of linguine or spaghetti or fettuccine. But we're going to make a wider pasta, pappardelle, sort of ribbons. And so what I want to do is line this up and then we will just fold it over. and cut it into ribbons about a half an inch thick. And before this has a chance to stick together, open it all up again.
And just to guarantee that it does not stick to itself, toss it with a little bit of pasta flour. Put it over here. Many people like to store it in portion size nests. Some people, if they intend to dry it, will hang it on what looks like a clothesline or a bar so that it can dry. But we're going to uh, serve this a little bit quicker. And so I'm just going to put it on a pan like this. So one last word of caution. If you decide to do this yourself, make sure that when you make the pasta initially, you don't allow it to get too wet in the food processor. Uh, if you do, you'll run into problems with your, your pasta sticking to itself, and that's not what you want at all. So make sure that you work it a little bit dry. That's the secret, I think, to good handmade pasta. Now, you might ask yourself, why would I go to the trouble of doing this when I could just go to the store and buy pasta? Well, most of the pasta that you will get in the store will be uh, semolina flour and water. That's it. There likely is no eggs in it, so this will be a richer, a more tender pasta. And I think it's really pretty special. It's worth the extra effort. For the first half an hour or so after you've cut your pasta, it's not a bad idea just to periodically come through here and give it a little stir, make sure that it's nice and loose and it hasn't stuck to itself. And then by that point, it will have dried out to the point where you don't even have to worry about it any longer. There we are. So that's Pasta 101. to make a sauce to go with that pasta. And the sauce that I'm going to make, you probably know as meat sauce. But uh, in central Italy, they call it ragu bolognese. And uh, it starts with a little bit of pancetta in a pan. And I've cooked it and rendered all of the fat. So the fat has come out of it. And in that fat, I'm going to cook onions and carrots and celery. And I'm going to begin to brown those vegetables in this fat. Now, the pancetta left behind a little film of goodness on the bottom of the pan. The juices that came from the pork evaporated their liquid and ended up clinging to the pan. As I introduce this bunch of vegetables, they bring a certain amount of moisture with them. And that, in effect, frees that, that film on the pan, that fond. So I'm deglazing with vegetables. As this is cooking, the way I think of this dish is as uh, an expression of flavor, but not just a single simple flavor, but layered flavors. So it begins with the pork. And on top of that, we take these vegetables and we brown those. And there's another layer of flavor that we've added to the mix. Uh, as this recipe unfolds, I'd love to have you pay attention to all the different layers of flavor we add, one on top of the other on top of the other. That complexity is what makes this ragu bolognese something really special. Certainly, it's more than tomato sauce with hamburger in it, a lot more. As I see those onions turn translucent and they start to take on just a little bit of color, then I want to move on. I've got here some beef, and we're going to add beef. This is not ground beef, but instead beef that's been diced up about a quarter of an inch on a side. This just happens to be skirt steak. Any sort of rich cut would be appropriate. Shank meat would be fine. Anything from the shoulder, the chuck, would also be fine. As I said, this is skirt steak, and so in it goes. And once again, I'm introducing a little bit of moisture. You can hear the sizzle. That's just the water in that meat coming out. And again, deglazing the pan. This is a whole new layer of flavor. The richness of this meat is really the heart and soul of this sauce. What I want to do is cook it until it begins to brown. I'd like to have it nicely browned but I don't want to cook it so long that it gets dry and crusty and overly brown. So it's been about 10 minutes. The meat has begun to brown, and each time I add a new ingredient, 
it introduces water into the pan. It kind of cleans the pan up. That water reduces. And when the water's all gone, then the temperature can rise and things begin to brown. If you look into the bottom of this pan, what you'll notice is a lot of meat juices now that have clung to the pan. And before they burn, it's an important thing that I free them by deglazing with a little bit of white wine. So in it goes. Just a quick word about cooking wine. Uh, a white wine should have a, sort of an acidic body. It should be a, a, a pretty sharp wine. It's that acid that gives structure to this dish. If it were a red wine, I would say the body or the structure could be tannin, and a red wine certainly should have an appropriate and full color. But for white wine, you're looking for that acidic backbone that lifts the dish that you're cooking. Okay, uh, with the liquid in there, I can go and clean up all of the, the meat juices that have clung to the bottom. This is how you earn your money here. Doesn't take long, but you have to pay attention to it. I did not want to let the meat get crusty and hard. Neither did I want the pan to become black and burnt. So everything's all cleaned up now. You can almost hear this, the change in sound. As the water is gone, um, the sizzling, the sound of the sizzling changes. So we've gotten rid of the water. The next thing I'm gonna add, and this is another layer of flavor, is tomato paste. And this tomato paste is going to be sauteed just briefly in the pan and then thinned out with some veal stock or some beef stock. Now, in goes that stock. And from this point forward, it's important that this cook very, very slowly. Really what you want to accomplish is you want that meat to get tender, but you don't want to add a lot of liquid and water down the flavor of that meat. So, uh, the meat is barely covered, and to slow down how quickly it cooks or how quickly the, the moisture can evaporate, I'm going to put um, what the French call, anyways, a cartouche, a little paper lid that you make by folding a piece of paper in half and then half again and half again until you get something like this, and then you measure how big it needs to be and you tear it off. So we've got a little lid, and I'm gonna take that lid, and I'm gonna put it right on top of the meat. I'm gonna turn it down to a very, very low, low simmer, and I'm even gonna put a lid on it so that it can cook gently. Now, it will continue to reduce little by little. It'll probably cook slowly like this for about 45 minutes, and then that stock will be almost gone. And from that point forward, gentle little additions of milk. Uh, one, then the next, then the next. Keeping it moist, but not soupy. Um, so while that's happily simmering away there, I want to talk about an accompaniment to our ragu bolognese over our handmade noodles. And that accompaniment's going to be a salad. The salad that we're going to make is with bitter greens. And the reason for bitter greens is that this is a fairly rich dish and it's gonna become richer before we're done. So bitter greens act as kind of a digestive. Uh, we tend to like sweet, tender baby lettuces here, but in Italy, they have a fondness for bitter greens and they understand how they fit into the meal. So a couple of rules about salads. This is sort of a three colored salad. Um, and I've got four different greens here. We'll have to decide exactly what we want to put in. Uh, I know that I want radicchio. This is a, a full-on bitter green right here. And this radicchio uh, demands a lot of seasoning because it is so bitter. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to cut it in half. You can see now the core. And I'm going to take that core and cut through it again 
just so that I can cut it out. And we'll get rid of the core. Now, all of these lettuces I washed in ice water about three hours ago. And I think that's an important idea. Lettuces tend to wilt. They're mostly moisture, and as soon as they begin to lose moisture, they get a little tired and lackluster. So that's the bad news. The good news is you put them into cold water and they will become turgid again. They will absorb water, they'll become crisp. And what you need to do is wash them in cold water well in advance of your meal and then spin them dry or blot them dry with a towel and then finally put them into the refrigerator. Uh, whenever I begin a meal, Getting the salad greens ready is really where I start. I probably would start the salad even before the ragu bolognese. So I like to tear greens into pieces so that it looks a little bit more natural. I don't like the pieces to be too small. I like them to show and I like them to be recognizable. And if you have water on those greens, just blot that water dry. The great thing about storing your greens for an hour or two in the refrigerator before you're ready to go, you wrap them in a towel and a towel will absorb all that excess moisture. All right, then I want to add sort of a more flavorful nutty green. So here's some arugula. And you can see how it kind of stands up and takes notice. That's because it's been washed in ice water. Now we've got a beautiful salad coming together. Uh, we've got two more options. One would be frise. This is a curly endive. And I like this because it lends uh, a fluffiness to salads. It makes salads a little bit lighter. The other option is Belgian endive and I brought it because I, I found it in the store and oftentimes Belgian endive is sitting there exposed to the light and it's at its best when it's very, very pale, protected from light. So it doesn't do it any good to be exposed to the light. Um, what you're gonna see is the tips of the leaves will start to turn green again and it starts to become a little bit unpleasant. So let's leave that one behind. And instead, I'm going to use this frise. And what I like to do is cut away the darkest of these green leaves. They tend to be a little bit coarse. And then we'll cut the core. And add this to our salad. Done right, a salad like this becomes very, very light. And it tells a story of freshness and vitality that is underscored by the olive oil that we're gonna to use to dress it. All right, let me set this aside for a second. And we're gonna look in on what we've got going here. You should Check it periodically, but you want it to be maintained at the barest simmer. Um, that's sort of where we're at right here, and that's exactly what you want. You keep it there for a long time and just simmer it very, very gently. Now, let me switch this out. We don't have 45 minutes to wait, but let me just switch this out with another pan. And I'm gonna take the paper top off. and we'll discard that. And let's see what we've got. So the meat is all tender. And along the way, I've added some milk. This has been cooking for about two hours. And with each addition of milk, it seems to get a little bit creamier. But I wanna finish this ragu bolognese with some cream, and I wanna reduce it before I add it. So. I'll put it into a pan and we'll reduce it by a half to two thirds. I want it to become much, much thicker before I add it. Now this sauce should not be soupy. 
it should be relatively firm. So I've turned the heat up. We're going to bring this down just a little bit. And I think we can go ahead and put some pasta on to cook. So the water is boiling. Let's go ahead and put some pasta in the water. Pasta likes plenty of water to cook in. Pasta and fish like water. And that water should be salted. And if you're familiar with cooking pasta and it takes, you know, 9 to 11 minutes, you can expect that fresh pasta will cook in about half that time. Let's go ahead and finish up this ragu. From this point on, you should pay attention to the consistency. As I said, it should be thick and it should be liquid, but not soupy. So you can see it's fairly thick in the pan, almost holds its shape on a spoon. And we're going to add the cream to it. And that will smooth it right out. It really looks great. The sauce has a beautiful appearance to it. And let's just taste it. Very nice. Sometimes in traditional recipes, you'll see that in addition to the meat, they will add mushrooms, wild mushrooms or cultivated mushrooms, and brown those along with the meat. So if you like that idea, it's uh, a way of adding some more complexity to, to what's going on there. All right. Pasta is cooking. And I'm going to offer up a little trick that you might enjoy. And that is, how do you know when pasta is done? Well, you can taste it. But oftentimes what I will do is cut it and look at the cross section. And if there's a core of the pasta that remains a little bit chalky and white, and it's going to be difficult to see. But if there's a core right there that remains chalky and white, and it eats tough, chances are it needs a little bit more cooking. That notion of al dente does not mean raw. It means that it, it has a little bit of resistance to the tooth. But as I said, this will cook in about four minutes. While the pasta finishes cooking, I'm going to dress this salad. Uh, I want to make sure to season it with salt and pepper. And then I'm going to take a really punchy extra virgin olive oil. The olive oils from Tuscany have a lot of, uh, a lot of complexity and pepperiness and bitterness and pungency to them. And you want to be generous with the olive oil. And then a little bit stingy with the vinegar. And what we'll do is we'll toss that right in the bowl. This is the kind of thing that might even happen at the table in Italy. And if you had a salad in this country, all of your guests might say, oh my God, your dressing is delicious. And you could feel justly proud of that. But there, the, the conversation is not so much about the dressing, but about the quality of the olive oil. That's what you want to crow about. There's the salad done. And I'm going to drain that pasta. Very nice. Now, the thing I would have you notice is that these noodles kind of sit up and take notice. They don't lie sort of lifeless on the plate, and that's an important consideration. And we're going to ladle this right over the top. And a little snow on the mountaintop, a little Parmesan cheese. 
to lend a wonderful savory element right at the end. And our pappardelle with ragu bolognese is done as well. It's a simple meal, but there's a lot that went into it, and I think when you taste it, you'll appreciate the complexity. You can taste the time, care, and attention that went into creating a rich pasta dish with homemade noodles and a really delicious bitter salad that acts as a wonderful partner at the table for this pasta dish. With a complicated entree like ragu bolognese over handmade noodles, I can't imagine wanting to spend a lot of time on a first course. So I've got something pretty simple here. You may know it, stracciatelle is a, a soup, a chicken broth with little rags in it. And those little rags are made up of egg. It's very, very quick to do. If you've ever eaten in an Asian restaurant and eaten egg drop soup, it's exactly the same thing. Basically, we're gonna take an egg and we're gonna whip it. You wanna break up the structure of this egg so it's homogenous. Meanwhile, you've got your chicken broth well seasoned and on the heat and at a simmer. Now, I'm gonna add some semolina flour to the egg. and whip it so there's no lumps in there. And I'm going to add some Parmesan cheese to that as well. So set that aside. And before we add it to the soup, I've got some herbs. Oftentimes I like to add herbs to this soup. And it can be anything that you have. I, I sometimes just use parsley. Today I went out to the herb garden and I found wonderful sorrel. And so I'm gonna take this sorrel and just cut it into ribbons. If you've never had sorrel, sometimes it's called uh, sour grass. It has a wonderful lemony flavor. So this soup becomes very, very bright with sorrel and savory because it's chicken broth and because it's got the Parmesan cheese in it. The other thing about sorrel, there's so much acid in it that it almost purees itself when you put it to the soup. When the heat gets to it, it, it falls apart pretty quickly. So let's put that back on here. And again, give this one good stir, and then we're going to add it to the soup and stir it in. And I'm going to add some sorrel as well. This soup is done. For something as simple as this is, it looks very, very classy, I think. It looks like you've put a lot of effort into it. And it can be our little secret that it was as simple as one, two, three. I think a little pinch of pepper, and we're ready to go to the table. So there you have it, a pretty simple meal. Simple in terms of ingredients, but the preparation really demands some attention. We learned how to make pasta, we learned how to make ragu bolognese. We learned a little bit about salads, and we learned a really simple soup. And if you wanted to finish, Dessert in the Mediterranean oftentimes is nothing more than perfectly ripe fruit. And this is what we found today when we went to the larder. You know, grapes, perfectly ripe figs, peaches, and nectarines. With a glass of wine, this is a delicious meal that I know you'll enjoy.